been talking about wildlife management at the landings and really talk through kind of all facets of who does the wildlife management, um, different programs that are in place, what federal and state agencies are in place protecting the wildlife, and then how the association all the way down to the homeowner um, really manages some of the wildlife issues that we have on the island. Um, again, wildlife is a resource uh, here on the island, so we'll kind of go through and talk about programs we have in place and some of the successes and some of the areas we have challenges with. This is just a really good example of all the different animals and species that are kind of what we always say, human wildlife conflict that we try to mitigate and manage, and we do that in a couple different ways. So, first is kind of thinking of this, you know, scaling down from the federal government all the way down to the individual of who really manages uh, wildlife and land needs. U.S. Fish and Wildlife is a big one that, that sets forth any state law or federal laws and, and uh, programs that we have to follow. USDA is another federal agency that actually is able to work within and outside of some of the areas uh, as far as, uh, you know, permitting and depredation. The Georgia Department of Natural Resources. Uh, most people don't realize, but the state actually is the owner, if you will, of all the wildlife or animals uh, within the state. And they're tasked with really the protection um, and, and proper management of that resource for, for the state. Uh, we also have the Landings Association. Uh, two of our nonprofit groups, kind of just to get you thinking about different types of wildlife, are CCA. CCA does a lot of work with our fishery management programs. They assist us in um, the collection and testing of all of our lagoons for our freshwater. Um, Skidaway Audubon does a lot of habitat improvement pro programs throughout the community for everything from songbirds to turtles um, to owls all throughout the different areas. Then you have kind of your private pest companies that will come out and do work on private landowners' property. A lot of this is dealing with um, some of your nuisance, like you know marsh rats and uh, other problems are having from insects to um, you know, the, the termites and those kind of things. And then we have residents that will also do their own kind of wildlife management within their properties. Um, you know, raccoons, armadillos, possums, those kind of uh, nuisance in the past we've assisted with. However, we have not been able to assist as on private property because essentially the federal government would be competing with private industry. And so that's kind of frowned upon. So we can assist with the knowledge we have and tell people how to do it but we can't physically compete with private industry when it comes to um, the programs. So here, just to kind of recap, the Wildlife Resources Division is charged with uh, conserving, enhancing, and promoting Georgia's wildlife resources. One of the big things we're gonna talk about today is deer. That's probably our number one complaint, if you will, here on, on being on a barrier island. Um, Georgia Wildlife Resources Division really sets forth the programs that we can implement. And so we have to have either a state or federal agency to actually go through and implement that. And that's why we have a contract with the USDA. If we get outside of those black and white uh, laws, that's when the law enforcement division gets involved. Uh, that group comes out and is really charged with being the legal entity uh, that will come in and actually enforce or have enforcement issues. Um, they address those either with fines uh, up to jail. So a lot of people say, well, just do this. I don't like visits from this group. I can work with this group, but this group, usually when they're coming in, they're coming in with a very specific task. So we have to make sure that we're staying within those boundaries. And then from a, a federal level, uh, we use the USDA APHIS Wildlife Services Department uh, to do all of our really wildlife management within the island. They are able to get permits uh, through both state and federal agencies to mitigate any problems we have with wildlife. So in most cases, the private individual uh, cannot go out and just get a mitigation permit uh, for species that are uh, offending, if you will. But with uh, using the USDA, they're able to actually not only get permits specifically for the island, but also use permits across the state uh, for different species. So we're able to actually go through and, and address um, just about every concern we have with the, the picture the pictures you saw earlier of all those different species. We're able to address all those through these permits with the USDA. So just a little bit of history of how we got to this point, and it's always interesting to look back um, and try to understand of how we got here and some of the challenges and, and um, you know hurdles we had to go over. In 1992, the board of directors passed a resolution uh, to allow the thinning of the herd of deer on the island. 
At that time, there was estimated uh, at about 80 to 82 deer per square mile on the island. To put that in reference, we're closer to 15 to 20 now. Um, so, you know, you think about that four times the amount of deer population on the island. The island also had a lot more habitat because it was, you know, just starting development. They're going through, planning out lots, roads, golf courses are in, but a lot of houses are still in the process of being built. So there's a lot more habitat for those deer to be in. Um, of course, with anything, we got opposition. Uh, the board of directors was challenged all the way up to the Georgia Supreme Court. Um, a group of opposition put in an uh, injunction actually preventing the Land Needs Association from being able to go out and, and manage the wildlife and also the state. In 1993, uh, the opposing group actually put in for a permanent injunction so that we would not be able to, to have any kind of management program. <laughs> We're lucky because the Georgia Supreme Court overthrew that, mm -hmm. and that really was the first program <coughs> in Georgia uh, that really started a lot of other uh, communities, uh, gated and private, public, and other, um, you know, even research facilities to start doing management programs within their boundaries with, in conjunction with the USDA and the uh, state. So in 1994, we now have permission to kind of move forward from the state and federal levels. We're able to get a group of shareholders together. So part of this process was getting everyone together. One of the requirements of the state is that we just cannot go through and say, we don't like deer, so we're gonna kill them all. Mm -hmm. They want us to manage the, the population. So when we're looking at it, we're looking to balance out safety concerns. We're looking to balance out the concerns with any of the uh, you know damage that's being associated to private property and trying to find a balance point of not only what's good for the community, but what's also good for the herd health. And so our program is always that balance point. Um, I can tell you anytime you talk to anyone in the community about the deer, they're, it's really a polarizing program. They're either you're killing too many or you're not doing anything. Mm -hmm. And so there's no one that's like, yeah, you guys are getting it right on the head, keep it going. <laughs> and so it's one of those programs that we kind of talk about when we need to, but for the most part, we get to keep that program moving throughout the months. Um, to keep a successful, pro, you know, long-term goal, not only for the deer, but for the community as, as a whole. So that stakeholder group really put together kind of the, the framework uh, that the state then agreed to, and that's what we use for the basis of our, our program. That stakeholder group just wasn't the landings. It was landings, uh, Modena, South Harbor, uh, University of Georgia on the north end of the island. So it was stakeholders from all across the island that really looked at it holistically. The landings became kind of the owner, if you will, and the one that manages the program, um, and then we moved forward. First year uh, of the program, we removed 660 deer. Um, so with that being said, it was multiple uh, USDA agents out here working and really just doing a blitzkrieg, if you will, to try to get the deer down as much as possible. From that time then, we realized that you have to have an ongoing management program uh, to be able to be successful. A lot of other communities come in and do like a one-time hunt, um, and everything's great for about two, three months. And then Jonathan, our USDA rep, calls it the Hooper effect. So you kill out uh, a population within the boundaries, and then all those resources are there, and it sucks all those deer back in because they're going to go where the habitat's more favorable. And we truly create a favorable habitat just with our uh, development of the island. So. From that, we then started a, a, a program where we went into three-quarter time employee for the USDA to be on site. The primary focus is going to be with the deer. Uh, secondary focus is going to be some of the other offending species as far as like coyotes, uh, feral pigs were really big um, back in the 90s and 2000s. We were removing close to 60 to 70 feral pigs a year. Um, and then the secondary, like the raccoons, armadillos, things of that nature. So that program started in 1998. We had a, you know, a reciprocal or a, a three-quarter time employee that was working on property and about 30 hours a week. But that didn't let me, I always tell, Jonathan's our nocturnal employee. A lot of time he's out here kind of at the end of the day and through the middle of the night up to two, three in the morning. Um, a lot of time what he's doing is setting up for either population surveys or setting up areas uh, for the culling of the deer when he goes out so that he can move them into areas that are safe to remove the deer. If you've been out here at night, I know some of the security at night, this island is a different animal. It's very dark and if you don't know it, uh, you don't know where everything is, um, it can be very dangerous. So it's critical that we kind of pre-plan and have things set up so that we have safe areas to actually do the work in. And again, Jonathan's working on all of these kind of offending species, deer, feral hogs, coyotes, 
Vultures are a big one. Um, we have a lot of problems, especially around the Rookery Lagoon. Um, the lagoon as you enter the Deer Creek Gate on the right side, anywhere where we have a lot of birds that are starting to nest, uh, vultures will take advantage of the nest. They'll actually fly in, knock the chicks out, and then go down and, and prey on them. Obviously, if you're living on a house in the Rookery Lagoon and you look out on your back porch and there's a vulture eating a baby chick, um, that makes it uh, quite a traumatic experience. <laughs> and so usually we get a call, we go out and we'll try to work around um, removing the vultures or, or trying to get rid of them without really uh, affecting the nesting. So it's kind of a balance point there too. Mm -hmm. um, we also assist property owners. And again, we can't physically do any kind of trapping on private property, but we can assist them with saying, all right, here's how you trap. This is how you get armadillos. This is what's working for raccoons. And then assist them with, uh, with the, the animal. Typically we then tell them to, to contact a third party to dispose of the animal. A lot of residents do what they do and they'll, <laughs> find their own way to dispose of the animal, which usually means picking it somewhere else and releasing it <laughs> into uh, another area, which only compounds the problem in other areas of the community. So for the most part, if we and if we are able to, and Jonathan's on site, he will collect some of the, the animals and be able to dispose of them. Uh, but for the most part, we try to have them work within the private industry for that. Just to break down, so our this program every year, uh, and the, the, the orange here is our budget, and then the, the blue is actual. You can see this, this one area line that's running across is kind of over, over time. Uh, since 2015 to 2024, we've really been able to keep this, this program pretty flat as far as costs. Uh, years we exceed budget are typically years we're pushing to remove more, we're having population surveys that are coming in showing higher deer po uh, populations than we would like, and so we actually do more removals during those years. This is a good example, just kind of showing you the, the progression over the years. The column on the left is uh, the deer that we've removed uh, over really since 2010, so over about 14 years. Um, I was down in Jekyll at a conference talking with their wildlife biologists, and they're looking to start a similar program. They have a lot of other hurdles they have to deal with as far as how their, that community was set up. Um, but they're closer to 80 deer per square mile like we were before we were developed. They were, you know, the biologist said to me, what are you taking out, like 50 or 60 a year? <laughs> and I said, no. I said, we're taking out on average about 150. And to be honest, we've been escalating the last couple of years just because we're seeing such a high population increase. Uh, last year, we were at 228. 2013 was another year you see a, a large spike there. That was another year that we actually pulled in DNR, had them really audit the USDA and come through and do population surveys and look at you know, where we are versus what our goals were and got the DNR actually authorized us to do additional hunts. So we brought a, secondary, a second sharpshooting crew in uh, that actually went through and, and worked on bringing in additional uh, removals. The challenge there again is you're bringing people in that aren't familiar with the island. And so there's a lot of, you know, a lot lower production because they wanna be, safety's always the number one priority with this. If they're not sure they have a clean, safe shot, um, they're not taking it. And so, and I can say in the, you know, 20 years that I've been here, um, we've had no safety incidents. We've had a few interactions uh, with residents. We've had a few interactions with deer that have gotten spooked with the lights on and run in and damaged property. Uh, but for the most part, it's been, it's been uh, a very safe program. One thing that's really interesting, you can kind of see since 2019, the escalation in the number of deer removed. Um, this is really coming to a couple of different factors that I'll talk about in here and where we have the challenges. But, you know, we are coming to an island that is almost fully developed. And so there's a lot less habitat. Uh, when you think about the habitat we have, we really created the perfect storm. Uh, deer love edge habitat. So we have six golf courses that give them uninterrupted walkways with edge habitat on both sides all throughout the community. We create policies to preserve oak trees, the number one food source for deer. We have residents that bring out all these exotic, delicious plants. <laughs> they plant them all over the place and then we water them. Uh, a lot of people don't realize, but deer get a majority of their water from vegetation. Um, and then we kick ourselves in the foot a little bit too by just going through and feeding. You know, a lot of residents will go out and feed the deer, um, which in turn, most of that is usually corn or dried grains. 
which then makes them thirsty. So then what do they do? They go to the neighbor's house and eat all the pretty vegetation. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we really kind of created this perfect storm and we're trying to manage uh, within this. Not only do we uh, track the, the deer removals, we also track residents' complaints. Again, you can see uh, the deer removed in our residential complaints in 2013. That was a, a time where we brought in more. Um, and then we try to look at, one, not only where the complaints are coming from, but two, we'll go out and do site visits to see how kind of valid the complaints are. You know, we'll get a complaint all the way from there's deer poop in my yard to they destroyed $30,000 in landscaping. Mm -hmm. And so we have to go out and say, all right, what is truly a, a concern or an issue? And what is just somebody that's not used to living in a natural environment? A lot of our residents come from metropolitan areas. They're more concerned with rats than they are deer. And so when they retire and kind of get to this area, you know, it's a, it's a whole learning curve of saying, hey, you know, one of the beautiful things about this community is how responsibility it was developed to really preserve all the nature around it. And so that's one of the resources, if you will, for the community and trying to get them to understand um, to expect deer and that they'll always be here. A lot of times we get questions on kind of how the, and that's not Jonathan, this is uh, DNR uh, that came out in 13, uh, how we did the, the deer uh, population estimations. So we go around quarterly with spotlights and actually we have a 50 mile route that creates a amount of time or a spatial area that then we can do counts and, and we'll do that two to three times to be able to see how many deer are in per square mile. We then use that calculation to do two things. One, determine how many deer we need to take out and two, also uh, develop areas that have high densities of, of deer populations. This is a breakdown of kind of what we're seeing now uh, and it's pretty interesting. If you can see a lot of these, we have areas of travel corridors uh, this is the island, or this is the area off of West Cross, Long Island, Captain's Crossing area. There's a marshy area that runs through there. It's really a lot of high marsh. Um, the deer use that as a travel corridor to run through. A lot of our complaints are coming from the houses in that area. Over in Deer Creek, we have an area where we have a state park. And then we have close to 300 acres of, of natural areas that are part of the spray field system. And if you look, almost all of our complaints are coming in right through that travel corridor where those deer are just going from spot to spot. Um, a lot of the residents that live on this side of the lagoon, most of the deer are actually hooking through on the other side. So those are areas that Jonathan can focus. We also have areas on the south end. A lot of this is migration coming in off of the other barrier islands. Um, Green Island, Little Green Island are down here. Not only do we get deer from there, we also get feral hogs uh, that come off those islands. And they love acorns too, so we always say once they've kind of depleted their, their crop, if you will, on those islands, they'll swim across. And I don't know if you've ever seen a pig swim, but it can outswim a gold retriever, <laughs> uh, which is pretty amazing when they wow. come across that. Um, and they will come across at night, work into these little courtyards, and they'll actually come across onto the eastern marsh and stay in some of those little hammocks and then work their way back across the following day. So it's pretty interesting. And then we have other pockets, you know, that these three pockets, this one is associated with, this is off of uh, Priest Landing, associated with uh, a large natural area, plus we have an abundant food source that a resident provides uh, with a five gallon bucket about every day. Uh, we also have areas where we just can't be very successful managing. If you look, we don't have a lot of common property inside that little area. Those deer, Get very little pressure so they know and it's funny because you know Jonathan will shine a spotlight on them they'll get up and run and lay down right next to a house <laughs> they know nothing can happen to them and they're safe right there um and sometimes i feel like i'm the bird dog because you'll be like go, go run in there and scare that deer out of there <laughs> run into the guy's yard in the middle of the night <laughs> but i mean so those areas are, are really tough and so we actually have to use you know baiting stations to try to pull those deer out of there but if there's residents that are feeding in here, we can't compete with 50 residents that are putting corn out when we put 50 pounds out trying to get deer to come over. And so a lot of times we cannot move them out of there. Middle of Tidewater is another area, really from uh, Oyster Reef all the way over to uh, Modena is a heavy population of deer. It is one of our highest densities. Uh, for example, uh, this past, uh, actually December, we took 25 deer out of uh, one lot, actually, in, just in this area, right here. 
Um, and Jonathan always is amazed because he's like, I saw seven, I got, I removed six. He's like, I don't think we'll have any more problems. Because sits out the next night, he said, there's 13 in here now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so it's a constant battle of, of that recharge of that Hoover effect where they're getting sucked in. Huh. And then, so that's kind of a big challenge. And it's not all over. It is concentrated pockets where we're seeing these deer. The other challenge, uh, or not challenge, but a lot of things that people ask is then what do we do with the deer? Um, so all the deer are actually taken back to the, uh, the, land, the public works maintenance facility too, which is right across from the old recycling center. In the back we have a cooler and a processing site. Uh, USDA does a necropsy on all the deer. So essentially they're looking at the age, the sex, the weight. They're doing an overall health check looking for any kind of disease. Uh, sometimes they'll take blood samples to send off to make sure the overall health of the animals are, are good. Uh, and it's interesting. You know, when I started, the average weight of the deer out here was close to 80 to 90 pounds. Um, think about a big black lab. That's about the size they were. Yeah. We're averaging now about 140 to 150 pounds uh, on the hook, which means a couple things. One, the program's being successful because their overall health in the herd is good. Mm-hmm. We've had almost no uh, signs of disease within the herd, where previously the things that killed the deer were starvation, disease, or cars. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have a lot of near misses with cars, but we really haven't had any major accidents uh, with deer. Um, and so that's good, considering a lot of times deer will go to the, the right away in the shoulders, eating the grass, um, which puts them really in the quarter Green Island area. TLA then donates all the meat uh, to different food banks and charities. We actually pay to have it processed by different processing companies. Uh, they typically grind it all into bulk uh, hamburger, if you will, uh, and then we can donate to different charities. This is a pretty amazing fact that we don't, it's one of those things that you can be proud of, but you don't tout it, uh, but over 76 tons of venison have been donated to mm-hmm. families in need, charities, uh, throughout the start of the program. Um, and that's just taking an average weight of about 30 to 40 pounds per year that have been removed since the start of the program. So a lot of those go to different areas. Uh, we always ask look, for a lot of the charities, uh, to then just send a letter of appreciation or thank you to the board of directors so that we can, can kind of make sure that the board's aware of what's going on and, and how it's uh, being processed. This is a group we're actually working with right now, which is a group of um, disabled, uh, four disabled veterans, first responders. Um, they're actually saving us quite a bit of money because they're part of their process is they'll actually come and get the deer after they're field dressed. And they'll, as a group, go out and process the deer down into uh, different packaging so that they can then send it out to the families in need. So it's saving us, you know, close to six to $7,000 a year in processing fees. And it also gives them, they're trying to bring some of the, um, you know, either wounded or disabled veterans together for that camaraderie. And so it's been kind of a win-win-win uh, for all those involved. The Mana House is another one um, out in Recon area. Uh, that we've done and again you know that year we donated over a thousand pounds of venison uh, to the program and so you know a lot of people think well we're just taking all this to the dump Uh, the public works guys do have to go to the dump but it's not the good parts of the deer they have to take it's the other Um, and so but for the most part uh, all that meat is is being utilized and it's being utilized for you know families in need or people that are uh, really uh, come across some hard times Challenges with the program. This is the probably one of the biggest ones. And so you can kind of see this is the land needs development, if you will. Um, this is the area we can manage. It's roughly about, the Skidaway Island is about 17 square miles. The land needs is about 10. So t- about just over half we can actually manage. We can't go outside of technically our property to do the management. Um, so you have, if you think about it, you know, the average, the, the carrying capacity of the land, how many deer that the, the land can sustain is about 80 deer per square mile. We're taking everything inside the gates down to about 10 to 15 deer per square mile, which then everything's kind of filtering in. That's just on island. Now you go through seasonality changes, you know, we go through winter, we have a heavy influx of deer in. If you look at uh, unmanaged properties off island, just around us, we have Wausau Islands, about four square miles. DNR population studies out there, about 81 deer per square mile. Ossabal is 14 square miles. Uh, not uncommon for the deer to be able to move across. If anyone watched the uh, 
the golf tournament in Hilton Head this past year. Uh, they had a herd of about 14 deer that left sea pines that were swimming over to the Fusky uh, because of all the crowds that came on for the golf course. They swim very well. They can swim barrier island to barrier island. You have the Fizz and the Gun Club. It's another 1.7 square miles. Wormslow is another uh, almost a square mile. And then Green Island is about another square mile. And so if you look at all that, the amount of deer that the land can hold off the island is almost 1,700 deer. We're trying to keep the deer on the island to about 150. And we have the best property, food source, mm -hmm. habitat available. And we also have you know, policies where we don't allow fences. And so it's kind of unobstructed uh, rights for those to come through. So again, as Jonathan says, the Hoover effect, everything's getting sucked in. Um, so more management in those areas will definitely help us long-term. Um, but this is one of the challenges that we have to come up with and try to address. The other one, and I had a much better picture than this, but the resident called me and said, I'm not allowed to use it in presentations. <laughs> um, and so we, I found this as a stock photo. Um, is feeding deer. Again, I don't, we, could, we don't have a big enough budget to even combat with the amount of food that residents put out. We start to go, and, you know, and it's all good intention. You know, the one resident that I talked to, she said, well, you know, this doe had a, a fawn in my backyard and she looked so skinny. I felt bad. I wanted to help. And so I started feeding. And then that turned into a doe and a fawn we're eating to the picture I took. I think there was 14 deer <laughs> waiting at her side door as she came out with a bucket and dumped the food out. Um, Good thing is I didn't have to take the picture. I had about 12 different people that submitted it to me. <laughs> so I had options of which one I wanted to use. Um, but the problem with that is that it creates a really a nuisance for the neighbors. While the deer are coming in, they're staying in those areas. Um, they're going around and just devastating the plantings. You know, and then community development comes in and says, hey, your yard's not looking good. You gotta get this cleaned up. And so it's kind of a cyclical problem that we try to have to deal with. Um, not only that, but it also can create a problem for pets, for ticks, for disease transfer. And so when you have, it's unnatural for a population of deer to be that densely populated in say an acre. Um, and so you're really maintaining something that's unhealthy for the deer, unsafe for the neighbors, and a nuisance. So you have to be very careful with that. And you have to try to educate people of why it's such a bad thing. The other thing is that the food source why corn, it's kind of like feeding deer Snickers all day. <laughs> you know, I love Snickers, so I'd eat Snickers all day and <laughs> yeah. threw them out to me. But, you know, it's not, not the ability for the deer. It's not a healthy food source. So it's low in protein. It's usually high in sugars. And it makes for an unhealthy uh, population. And they also become reliant on it. You know, if you've been eating this 4,000 calorie diet day over day, and now all of a sudden they gotta go eat wax myrtle. Um, you know, they're not gonna prefer that. And, and it also, again, makes it very difficult for us to pull them out of those areas where we can actually safely remove them. This is a slide right out of the uh, DNR's presentation they gave in 2013 to the board. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of residents call and say, we need to quit killing them. We need to do a birth control study and, and do birth control for all the deer. Well, I gladly send that up to the wildlife biologists with the state, and they say, no, it's not allowed. The state of Georgia does not allow it unless you do it under the, in a controlled environment with non-native deer. So again, they're looking at it for the overall health of the, the, the deer itself, not the kind of the one-offs, if you will. South Carolina did allow for a birth control study. Challenge is you have to catch the deer, which if you've ever caught a deer, <laughs> I've caught them in the soccer nets out here, uh, potentially, and it's not fun. Um, you have to tag the deer, then you have to inoculate the deer, and then you release it, and that works for about six to eight months. And then you start the process over. And again, we're only able to get about 150 deer that are here on the island. What about the other 1,800 that are coming in? So how successful is it? That process, Fripp Island did a study where they went through that process. It was about six times uh, the cost per deer to go through and, and do uh, birth control. Um, and the problem was that it was really not successful. So there's no controls on that. Um, the two effective methods the state will allow is sharpshooting, which is what we do. 
And controlled hunts, a lot of times they'll do that in state-owned properties where they'll just sit out that you quota hunts and they say, all right, the first 100 people are going to come and you can shoot two deer and they go out and, and manage those. <laughs> Release of predators. Uh, there's uh, all kinds of funny videos you can watch where they, you know, you have a bird, they release a snake, and then they have to find something to kill the snake, and then it's, you know, that whole food chain thing that you're interrupting. It's not allowed. Trap and relocation is also not allowed. Trap and relocation was, uh, was occurring in some western states. If you're familiar with the Midwest and some of the challenges they've had, they actually spread uh, chronic wasting disease from the west coast uh, in Colorado area into Wisconsin, Minnesota. And it's actually devastated a lot of the deer populations, but a lot of disease transfer happens when you do that because these deer are naturally going to travel as long distances. So if you do have disease, essentially it's going to be in pockets, not spread across the country. So again, what we are allowed to do, really from the state standpoint, are two things. Controlled hunts and sharpshooters. I don't think many of our residents would appreciate it if we started letting other people come in and just <laughs> sit up on the trees uh, <laughs> around the community. But, and our USDA definitely does a great job of, of being a safe and effective uh, challenge or removal process. So that's deer. Does anyone have a question on deer before we just touch base on a couple other quick items? How often do you reproduce? <clears throat> so that's pretty interesting. Um, they reproduce annually. Uh, typically, they'll start about April uh, as the fawning season, and it'll stop August, September, all depending on uh, the time when the, the female was impregnated. Uh, one of the really cool things that I've seen out here over time is that most people will assume that a deer will have a single baby. Um, actually, the, the female has the ability uh, to release multiple eggs, and so if you've seen out here, we've seen uh, twins and even triplets. So in a lot of cases, if the overall health of the deer are, are high, they'll actually produce a higher percentage of twins and triplets, um, which makes it even more difficult because now instead of a one-to-one, -one, you're really dealing with a three-to-one ratio of trying to remove. Um, a lot of the work Jonathan does is in the, the fall, between really the rutting season, the, the, when the deer are breeding, uh, up into uh, fawning season. We take a break during fawning season uh, because you know we definitely don't want to leave an orphan fawn that's hiding out in the woods, uh, out in the woods. And so during that time, we'll remove bucks. A lot of residents will actually call and say, "I've seen all these huge bucks everywhere." Um, that's by design. You can shoot out all the bucks, but to be honest, you control the population by controlling the females. And so you know, one buck can impregnate 100 females uh, during the rut. And so. Uh, if you have less females, and we really have very close to a one-to-one -one buck to doe ratio, which is unheard of uh, in a lot of areas. But that's why you do see a lot of times more bucks in the area. Any other questions on deer? Um, with Jonathan hunting the deer, is there is it a preference of his between using between shooting and you doing bow hunting? Yeah, so they do both. Um, the challenge with bow hunting is you know you'll climb up in a stand you'll be in a fixed location once you've shot once you've essentially alerted everything so usually you have a very low ratio of uh, success maybe one or two um, with hunting he's on the move and we've actually deployed this past year we actually got cellular based uh, cell uh, cameras that he can put out on bait piles so before he was just driving in a route checking different bait piles now he actually sits on his truck and he has, you know, lifetime feeds oh, nice. and he's like, all right, we're going to Delegal. And uh, he'll go down and be able to, because other times, and it's frustrating for him, he'll go out, put out the corn and everything, and go check, start the route. And by the time he gets back around, the deer have already been there, eating all the corn and it moved on. And so now it's kind of starting the process over. So majority of he's trying to get, you know, higher pot numbers, he'll be doing it uh, with rifle. And if he's trying to focus in a high density area where it's, uh, he doesn't have good shooting lanes, then it typically would be bow and arrow. But, you know, he's a true hunter, so he, he feels uh, better if he's doing it with bow and arrow than, uh, than rifle. Yeah. So, all right, the other program we have that I just want to touch base on quickly is the uh, alligator management program. One very important thing with this is this is a state's pro the state's program. Uh, it was put into place in 1989 as a nuisance alligator program. Uh, American alligator is a great comeback story. Almost really hunted to extinction uh, without any kind of protections. Uh, really in Georgia, I think at one time they said less than 100 in the wild. 
Um, and so if you start to think about that, the state stepped in, looked at that natural resource, said, all right, we need to protect this, you know, kind of an apex predator in most cases. They were able to have huge success um, now to the point where then in 1989, they had to create a nuisance alligator program. <laughs> <laughs> and so now this is a, a program that allows the state to actually manage alligators to get into the wrong areas. And the natural environment are fine. When they get into a residential golf community, they can be a problem, uh, especially when they start to breed or they're larger in size and more aggressive. So their program, uh, the, how it works, the association, all we do is assist by essentially collecting information from the residents going out verifying if there is an animal and then reporting it to DNR. They issue a permit to Jack. Uh, Jack is the only licensed trapper within three counties uh, that can come out and do the removal. And believe it or not, Jack doesn't get paid by the state or any individuals um, with a, without this exception if it's under four feet because he can't destroy that animal. How he gets his money is he's actually able to destroy the animal, uh, sell the hide, sell the meat. And so, if he's going out on some wild goose chases, um, that can really affect how well he's, he's really doing in this program. If you ever go to Love's Seafood, you might be eating out uh, from the landings at some point, uh, but Jack does um, all of the, the three coastal counties uh, closest to us uh, for alligator removal. And a lot of times the other challenge is, is you know, a resident may call in an alligator on a certain pond and say, it's, oh, it's here. Well, that alligator will move two or three different ponds in each direction. Jack comes out, will look, determine if it's aggressive. If it's aggressive, he'll take it out regardless of size. Um, if it's one that is um, over really eight foot, he'll also remove it. Um, and nine times out of 10, it has to be destroyed. One thing they changed this past year is this, if it's under four foot. If you call in, so we have some residents that call in and say, they, can't, they don't want to tolerate any alligators at all in their ponds. And so if they see one, they're calling, if it's under four foot, Jack will come out, he'll remove it, but he's gonna, he's gonna remove it at their expense because nine times out of 10, he has to relocate that animal. He can't destroy it because it's under four foot. He will nor get a permit for it, but he'll catch it and rem remove it. We always get an alligator that's about three foot long in the kids' lagoon about a week before the kids' fishing trip. Oh, no. <laughs> and so, you know, we've had to pay Jack in a couple kids' situations to come out and, and grab that animal and, and remove it. Uh, most of the alligators we take out are anywhere from six to, uh, the largest we have is about 11 foot, 11 six, uh, was a little over 500 pounds. And believe it or not, was in a pond that was about a quarter acre, one of the smaller ponds on the island. Wow. Hmm. So scary situation if you live near or around it. Mm -hmm. Which is always funny because we get the reports and it's, oh, it's humongous. And we go out there and it's uh, <laughs> you know, a two foot alligator. <laughs> uh, but in this case, they were absolutely right. <laughs> um, also feral hogs. Uh, we still do have a few hogs on the island. Like I said, if you've been down to Delegal, you've seen, if you look across the river at Little Green Island, you'll see the pigs out there rooting all the way in the marsh. Um, they will swim across the river all the time. We'll start getting reports of, usually from residents say, I don't know what the heck happened. My yard was beautiful yesterday. Now it's rolled up in the corner. <laughs> yeah. um, it's usually a great sign that it's feral hogs. And what they're doing is they're looking for grubs, roots, acorns. They love their omnivores, so they eat a little bit of everything. Um, crazy thing about feral hogs is they're able to do about $1.5 billion in damage uh, to the United States each year. Uh, interesting fact, to maintain a zero population with feral hogs, and this is why they're so successful, you have to kill about 70% of the population every year. So when you think about agricultural lands, lands that are heavily forested, Hawaii, some of those other areas where feral hogs have been introduced, if you're not killing 70% of the population, the population is continuing to grow. Wow. And so we were lucky, we were able to catch this early on the island. Um, and like I said, previously we were removing 60 to 70 a year. I think last year we had six uh, that we removed that just showed up. I'm not even sure where they came from. Um, where we have some volunteer uh, wildlife managers that are like them on the island and moving <laughs> them around, but um, they just show up and then we address them usually pretty quickly. Uh, we do have one in the north field. Um, so if you see right now, Jonathan's semi been trying to actively pursue them. It's a, a larger boar, black and white boar. <laughs> some new species that have showed up in the last couple of years, coyotes, one of them. Uh, historically, we've never had coyotes out here. We always would get calls for you know, many years uh, about 
you know, this black cougar I saw on, on the island. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of our coyotes actually are mar much darker in color uh, than this one. They're a darker pigment. Uh, and they're fairly healthy because they have a lot of food source with raccoons and armadillos and all the little critters we have running around. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, I, you know, for years, I think we had a small pack that was showing up and then ultimately we had a larger population that showed up. They're on Tybee, they're on Hilton Head, they're on Wilmington Island, Ossabaugh, Wausau. Um, this is one of those things people say, I don't like them, get rid of them. The USDA, the federal government, since 1947 has been chasing coyotes, trying to stop them from migrating from the west to the east. Well, I can tell you they can't get much more east than us. <laughs> um, and so the federal government has not had success. I don't think the Land Needs Association <laughs> is going to be able to control these. And so um, what we do is we try to make it an un unfriendly habitat. Uh, so when they come in, we harass them. Um, usually with Jonathan going around, if he's able to, he'll uh, remove them. If we do reports of certain animals that are hanging around different residential areas, we can actually set up and trap or do night hunts on them. Uh, and on average, three to six a year. One of the biggest challenges is the most successful way to remove coyotes is to, is to trap them with lake hole traps. But coyotes is a canine species and our residents don't walk a lot of their dogs on leashes. And what attracts a coyote also attracts a black lab, golden retriever, German shepherd. And so the last thing I ever wanna see is a picture on Facebook or you know next door of a golden retriever with his foot in a, uh, you know, a, a lake trap. So we do trap from time to time. We put up signage everywhere. And to be honest, within about three to four days, we'll have our first resident running their dog in those areas. And we go and shut all the traps off. That's it, we're done. You know, safety again is, is paramount. So that's one of the challenges with the coyotes. The other disadvantage, and it's kind of interesting looking at kind of the uh, progression of some of these predatory species. When I first got out here, we had gray fox, uh, which was nat as a native species. They got displaced by the red fox, mm -hmm. and we've had a lot of red fox. Now the coyotes are out here, you see less red fox, and the coyotes are kind of the dominant uh, in, that, in that niche, if you will. But we need to work through it. The key is making sure people know they're there. If you're gonna have outdoor cats, they're gonna be a, viewed as a food source. Um, if you're not paying attention to your, you know, small dogs, those kind of things, you know, they're gonna, they're opportunistic. They're gonna take advantage of that. So making sure you know they're out there and doing what you need to do to protect your animals. Other items we talked a little bit about already is vultures. <laughs> vultures are pretty interesting. They will come out. Um, they love pool equipment. Yeah. They love BMW convertible tops, <laughs> and they love the flashing on the side of windows. Um, and I don't know why, but those are the things that they will always attack. Um, we get calls all the time uh, about them uh, damaging uh, like pool lounging equipment. Uh, they'll go down and pull the stuffing out of it. I don't know why. Um, and then they'll also go up to the windows and pull kind of the flashing out. I don't know if it's because it's shiny and they're inquisitive. Um, and so we'll go out and remove those. Um, the number one way we deter them is we'll go and put an effigy or a dead vulture and hang it. And so if you're familiar with vultures, not much can kill them. So if they look and they see a dead vulture and they said, what the heck? <laughs> Something killed that guy? We're out of here. Uh, you know, they, they'll fly away. Um, we have some that love it here so much that they'll go and land right next to the effigy and peck at it to see what's going on. Um, and then those are the ones that typically we have to remove and then they become the new effigy uh, <laughs> for the, uh, the next area. We did have to get uh, a few years ago an extra depredation permit from the state and U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, for an extra 25 birds because actually we had to remove more vultures from this island than the state of Georgia had permitted. And so we actually had to get another one. Um, and we've been able to address that. They are a great species to have around. I mean, they are the cleaning crew, if you will, of, of dead animals. So, you know, anything that the vultures find, they clean up, they remove, and part of that natural cycle. So there is a heck of a lot of benefit for them, hence why they're state and federally protected. Cormorant, or the um, uh, cormorants that are out here right now, Greg's been chasing these. If you guys get a call from Greg saying that, uh, I'm getting ready to deploy a bird bomb. Uh, what that means is that we got essentially like a firecracker that we set off to try to scare them out of a pond. These birds, if you ever watch them in a lagoon, are like a pack of hyenas. 
they'll get in lines and they dive. They're diving birds. They'll dive under and they'll push all the fish in a stock pond to a corner. On that corner are egrets and all the waiting birds that are sitting there just plucking away. And then the cormorants will dive through that school of fish one at a time. And they can literally clean out a pond um, wow. in no time flat. Obviously, we're paying a lot of money to stock the ponds, and we're trying to keep a you know, predator-prey relationship with bass and bluegill in the ponds. So when these guys get in here, uh, we tend to let them kind of winter over here. But the ones that want to be more permanent residents, then we <laughs> then we'll, uh, harass out of here uh, when spring comes. So we started the kind of the harassment process with this uh, to get them out of here. And again, kind of a cool process if you ever get to watch them kind of work yeah. as a pack. It's kind of neat how they do it. Woodpeckers. I know Carzell was here. We had a woodpecker that did a couple things. He liked hammering on the, the vent pipe on top of the building. Oh. And so if you ever, like the old woody woodpecker, that <laughs> would do that all day. And then once he got sick of that, he would go and fight with himself on the mirrors of the trucks. No. <laughs> and so we went through six mirrors uh, in about three weeks. Wow. Um, and then ultimately, we had to persuade him not to do that anymore by calling Jonathan. <laughs> uh, and so we, we had that one removed, but they do a lot of damage. They will get on these uh, cedar-sided houses looking, you know, there's some woodpeckers that will poke just little holes looking for cavities and wanting to find insects below, yellow belly sap suckers for them. Uh, but if they get on a house and start doing that, they can do a ton of property damage. Mm -hmm. And so Jonathan will go out and work with either try to find the offending species um, or work with the homeowners to say these are the different deterrents you can put up to try to get the, the woodpeckers to go away. In most cases, you can deter them away. The one we had to remove just wasn't right in the head. Yeah. So I don't know. What, he's the only one I've ever seen do that. Um, but again, federally and state protected species. So, you know, we as an individual can just go out and remove a woodpecker. That's where that, that permitting comes in. And then the other ones that we get a lot of complaints from from time to time armadillos. Really about 2017-18 is the first we ever saw armadillos on the island. Uh, you know, I, I remember going out when I first got here out to like crosswinds out in that area of Chatham County, and you would see them all over the place around the golf course. They work their way this way. Um, there's all kinds of theories of how they got on the island, because when they showed up on the island, it wasn't just like kind of a, a single funnel where you were getting reports and they're slowly spreading out. It was, all right, we got reports all the way down in Delago. We got reports up in uh, Marshwood. We got reports in Oak Ridge. And it was kind of an explosion from nothing to a lot. Um, so there was all kinds of theories of, of how that happened. Um, they are pretty much a blind species. The number one fact with them is that they, carry, they can carry leprosy. So a lot of people say don't touch them, leave them alone. They're, for the most part, blind. Um, and they just follow scents. So if you do have an armadillo and you have an armadillo den, mm -hmm. and you don't fill that back in after you trap them out of there, another armadillo will walk, find that scent trail, and literally follow it right into that den. Um, one, in most cases out here, we trap anywhere from three to four out of every den. So they will be in a, a small group. Um, and then a lot of times, they do a ton of damage. If you've ever seen like around the gates where there's looks like little pockets of pine straw pushed up, that's these guys, and they're looking for grubs, worms, things of that nature. Um, they get on the golf course, they tear up tee boxes, they tear up greens, um, and all kinds of problems. So, and in residential properties too. Again, these are species that uh, your private pest companies can uh, address. So the critter control, uh, Yates Astro are two that, that regularly do this kind of work on the island. If you're having them at your house, you can, you can have them uh, assist you with the trapping. One thing that's a lot of time consuming uh, with these is that if you do set up traps, you have to check them by law 20, every 24 hours. And so you can imagine if you have 20, 30 traps out, I mean, it's a full day just going around trying to check all those traps. Um, raccoons, another interesting species. Um, again, brilliant little animals. Uh, I always refer to them as the trash pandas because they are cute until they're ripping your trash out all over the place and then uh, you're going to pick them up. Uh, interesting thing with raccoons is we see a lot of cyclical um, population uh, growth and decline in raccoons out here. If you were out here about three or four years ago, 
Um, we had a ton of raccoons that were out here and then all of a sudden there was a large distemper outbreak and everyone thought, you know, they're seeing these raccoons that look drunk, kind of walking around in the middle of the day, stumbling all over the place. And it was distemper. And if you look at the cyclical, cyclical process, is the population would always get to about a certain level. And then you have a distemper outbreak and it drops back down. And so really disease is controlling that population. So if you have problems with raccoons, um, a lot of people that have bird feeders have problems with raccoons. Um, and they're brilliant in, in finding ways to get up there and, and get what they want. And so we'll trap them on common property and then the residents can also trap them on their own private property. And then this is a cartoon I took out of the Savannah Morning News. It was 825 of 1994. <laughs> um, and this was right when, uh, if you remember the timeline, this is right when our, our deer program was getting started. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's funny, it's a you know, little hunter on a golf cart down here chasing after the deer. And they say, live at the landings, you said. An exclusive island community, you said. The perfect place to retire, you said. <laughs> and they're running as bulls with past them. So, again, the deer population has always been a challenge being a barrier island. It's going to continue to always be a challenge. The goal of the program is to maintain a balance, uh, which should be really the case in, in most natural environments. Um, and then also to educate the community to make sure that we understand, you know, why we do the things we do, which is part of this process. So, with that, any questions on anything wildlife related? Um, I wanted to know: Do we have a snakehead um, program here? For we we have not located any snakehead on the island. It's actually a, a basic type of fish species, it's actually native, I think, to Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, big in the uh, fish, uh, you can buy most of them at local pet stores. To be honest, a lot of those can get into about central Florida and then the luck you know we're a little bit lucky because we get cold enough in the winter that a lot of them can't live so even if they're released most times they can't live this far north there's a lot of other invasive species that can and so like if anyone does have fish tanks of those kind of things surrender those fish back if you, you're going to take it down surrender them back to the pet stores sometimes you can sell them on Facebook and those other things but just don't release them into the ponds because they do create a, a problem with the, the local balance of the fish species Find a friend with an Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're cool in a fish tank, but not in a natural pond. Any other questions? What do they do with the armadillos when they, after they trap them? Do they just kill them? Yeah, they oh, kill okay. them. Um, and that's the best thing. I mean, a lot of those, if you start to move them or relocate, you're just moving and relocating the problem. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of it, too, is not only, you know, for the animal, but... If there's any disease associated, now you're introducing disease into some of those other areas. Mm -hmm. And so the best thing to do is just to, to remove them and destroy them. Same with the raccoons? Do they? Yeah, raccoons are the same. They will take, so it's interesting, the USDA does, uh, they call it pellet drops, but they'll do actually along the top of the Appalachian Ridge, they'll drop down uh, inoculations for like rabies, Wait, for raccoons. Yeah. And so it's a little pellet that has inoculation in it and they fly with a plane on the top of the ridge mountains and the guys hang out the side of it, they went out trying to stop rabies from actually coming over the top and getting to the East Coast. Mm -hmm. um, and so the problem with the raccoons is that that population, once it gets large enough, that's when you start to see the distemper and rabies <clears throat> issues. Um, and we do have, we have had positive tests of raccoons for rabies on the island. And so, and now that there's coyotes, but there's not other many, not many other natural predators uh, for those species. Because mm. a lot of times we control the predators, which in turn allows the bottom of the food chain to explode. Mm -hmm. So, any other questions? All right, thank y'all. Thanks, Sean.